Right. If you have the Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to Psalms 38. Psalms 38. And we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Psalms 38, uh, beginning in the first verse. The Bible says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. My loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you uh, for your book. Uh, we thank you that it's a good, solid foundation to build our lives on. Lord, we praise you for it, and we pray that you would help us to always abide by it. Lord, we pray tonight that you would honor your word with your presence and that you would bless us in a great, and wonderful, and marvelous way. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Now, we find a fairly familiar time in David's life, and there's a lot of suggestions what may have been going on at this time. But despite any of uh, placing it in a consensual order in his life, we do know this, he had some health problems. He had some challenges in the flesh. And he knew, and we'll get into that, he knew the origin of the problems was Almighty God. Now, uh, when the Bible says that the devil has accomplished a thing, you can take it as such, such as, have you considered my servant Job? But we have no other reason to think that this was an attack of Satan. Rather, I believe it was identifying David as one of his own. Uh, uh, we whip our own children. We don't whip other people's. Amen. And as difficult as a good whipping is, it's a good thing. It keeps us out of danger. It keeps us out of problems. It, it, it creates a boundary for us that we're not likely to cross. And so instead of being uh, commiserating over this, uh, we need to look at instances in our life and, and see if they can just be identified. Yes, it's difficult, and yes, it's painful, but more than that and above that, the Lord all God Almighty is saying, you belong to me. You're mine. And that's exactly what was happening here. Uh, uh, the first request that God, uh, David made of the Lord God Almighty is don't let this be done in while you're angry with me. Some suggest that he did the, that this was written at the time of the death of Uriah. And uh, if you'll remember, uh, God's man came in and said and told him the story of the one little ewe lamb. And the prophet looked at David and said, Thou art the man. And some people suggest that he wrote this in response of it. In other words, he didn't deny it. He didn't say, no, that wasn't me. And if you remember, he was given three choices how he would be punished. And all three of those choices had to do with his things, not with him personally. He could lose part of his army, and there could be a plague over his land, and there was one other, I can't remember what the third one was, and uh, David said, I can't make that choice. I, I don't know what to say. And so a lot of times, and we'll see that David had some of this going on, we look at us. But that rebuke may be coming from a different direction. It, it may not have anything to do with you specifically, but you see it later. I think personally for the United States, President Biden is, a, is an excellent example 
of the rebuke of Almighty God. He, uh, no man comes into authority unless God hath raised him up. So we can't blame the Democrats on getting him in. What got him in was the power of the Almighty. And so now we are suffering from that, and it will continue to be that way until we learn the lesson. You know, if your kids keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, just keep whipping them. They'll eventually learn. Uh, and sometimes it takes a bunch of whippings for them to say, gee, I shouldn't do this. But it's needful. Those things are needful. And so we find as David is in this situation of his life, he, he begs for the mercy of the Almighty that, that it wouldn't be done in so much anger that he would take his life. Now, we do know this from the study of the Word of God. What is the penalty of sin? Death. Exactly right. So, David knew God would be just if he killed him. And you know what? God would be just if he killed us too. Uh, wouldn't be one thing that you could say to fault the mighty God of heaven if he killed every one of us because that's, that, that's, the, that's the end result of sin always. And, and so David's first request, and I really b believe he did not necessarily make this on his own behalf, but more so that he knew Israel still needed a leader. This was before the birth of Solomon. And, and, and so he, he, he requests that of Almighty God. And you know what? We need to request that too. Uh, when, we're nowhere, when we know we're out of the will of God, play on his mercy. Play on his grace. Beg him that he not, not do this in a, in, in a severe anger way. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in wrath, in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Now we find two actions of the Almighty, and that is rebuke and chastening, or cha chasten. Rebuke is uh, stop what you're doing and then giving us a reason. Uh, you know why we shouldn't be, uh, a, a, be immoral? A married man shouldn't go with somebody else? Because it's the law of God. Yeah. And we're not, we're not to violate that in any kind of way. Grace didn't give us the permission to do things outside of the moral will of God. And if you go and do that, which David did, you're going to pay the consequences in this flesh. See, sin has a price. Right. Now, the ultimate price has been paid by the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that price, we get to spend glory with him. But you can't sin in this flesh and think it's going to be smooth sailing. You know what? People who openly sin and never have any problems, I doubt their salvation, sincerely. Because, see, a good daddy always gets on those boys and girls for what they do. And if they, they can live like dogs and continue on, listen, something is desperately wrong. Something is not right. And, and so we find as David uh, uh, pouring his heart out to God, he, said, he understands the two principles of the horrible wrath of God and the chasing of God. Verse 2, For thine arrows stick fast in me. So we begin to see some things that God will use, and I personally think the arrows are the word God. You know, if you can read that book and never be troubled by it, something's wrong with you. Yep. Yeah. That's his arrows. And, and he'll get you right here where, it, where it's the very best. And listen, it don't always have to be in preaching time. It can be simply sitting in your kitchen, reading the Word of God, and, and boom, in a moment's time, you're like, well, I've done that all my life. Never seen it before. Never understood it. That, that's what he does for his children. And so the first thing is the Word of God. He's going to chasten you with that. It, it's going to be times, you know, the Bible says of itself, and it is sharp as a two-edged sword. And a two-edged sword, there's sharpness on both sides instead of just one, and it cuts going and coming. 
It, 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 it cuts both ways. And the Word of God is like that at times. It's a rich reward of encouragement, but it's hot rebuke at times too. We allow a, a sin in our life, the rebuke of God is coming. And, and rejoice in it because it means that you belong to Him. So we see the first source of correction is, is the Word of God itself. And no, notice else what, what else it says. And thy hand presseth me. Now, if I tell Bella to do something or not to do something, first thing, and, and, and she chooses not to follow my directions, my first thing, and she'll tell you this, is Bella, you heard me. Right? That's the arrows. And they're hitting home. And she gets the idea, you know what? I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, the next, everybody knows the next step, right? Uh, you have to have physical rebuke. And that's because of the hardness of man's heart. You think all that Israel went through nationally, and they still didn't get it much of the time. They had to have that physical rebuke. 400 years in slavery. That's about, if you give 40 years for each generation, because they didn't have babies as quick as we do back then. And so that's 10 generations of not getting it, of it not striking home in the soul of man. And so he had to do it other ways until they were nothing more than slave labor that could be walked, walked under the, the Pharaoh's feet. That, that's a tough lesson, is it not? Because remember, <laughs> When it all started out, they were out in the land of Goshen. Perfect for their cattle. Their own brother was sitting on the throne of Egypt. And look where they're at now. Listen to the correction of God. Yeah. Listen to him before it becomes physical. <laughs> and, and the Lord will bless you greatly for that. So we find that David had keen understanding of what rebuke was and what was happening. So he says, Thy hand, it presseth, it presseth me sore. The whipping's been hard. Notice verse 3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. And again, sadly enough, what people understand most is problems with this not problems with this. We don't understand the problems of the soul of man nearly as much if we see the doctor shaking his head and say, yes, it's cancer. That, that rings home a lot more, doesn't it? And, and, and shame on us, but it is the truth. Every one of us are the same way. We, go, we may go months and not realize there's some little spiritual something that's just not right. And as soon as your cold sniffle comes, and we've all had that cold that's been going around, we passed it around like a quarter. And oh me, oh my, what am I gonna do now? See, the flesh gets your attention, and God hadn't created man, he knows that. So he'll get your attention the best way that you understand. And, and he'll fix you up. And, and so we find then, that sometimes these approaches in our life is nothing more so that we may acknowledge who God is and what his word is. And that's exactly what we need to do. And so he recognized his health problems were directly tied to how he had been living presently. There's no soundness in my flesh because of that anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Now, you ever thought about how precious rest is? Last night, I was so tired that I went to bed and it was still daylight outside. I remember my great-grandmother doing that, thinking, man, she's crazy. Mm -hmm. And now I understand why, why Grandma did that. <laughs> and, uh, I, I would, I, and I really hadn't worked that hard. I was just worn out. And so I laid down and I went to sleep, and I slept all the way to 6 o'clock this morning. And 
That's, it was such a good rest. I woke up so refreshed and good. But have you ever had those nights where you tumble back and forth and not even sick, just discontent in your own life? Just the lack of being comfortable with what's going on. Just the lack of being at rest despite horrible circumstances because you know God's in control. See, we need to be there as a people, do we not? That when, when everything else is falling apart around us, our God stands steadfast and strong. Now, we enjoy that when we're in the will of God. And, and sometimes when we're grasping for it and we're tumbling around and we're tossing and turning and no sweet rest comes, it's because of us. It, it's something in our life. It isn't God. And, and so we find that David has this recognition within himself that surely he had brought this on himself. Verse 4, he begins to acknowledge that my iniquities are gone over my head. Now, uh, when I was a kid, I don't even know if I could do it now, I'm probably drowned, but uh, I loved to swim as a child, even when uh, the children were young. I, I would take them swimming as often as they could. And there's a place over at home when I was growing up called Third Bridge. And going from Cumberland City to uh, Erin, obviously it was the Third Bridge. And it was a railroad bridge. And it was about 35 feet off the water. And the cool thing to do, if he was man enough, you know, we always was to jump off third bridge into the water. And I did it more than once. Now, the problem, and if you've ever went real deep, you'll know this, as you're coming back up, it's dark down there. And the way you know you're getting close to the surface, it gets lighter and lighter. Now, the problem with third bridge, when you're, set, when you're swimming back up, 15, 20 feet, sometimes you perceive that the color is the, uh, your own top when you're not. The water's still over your head, and you get a big mouthful of water, and you swim harder. <laughs> See, that's what David was experiencing, his, his sin. His sin was so far over him, he couldn't see the light of day anymore. He couldn't see the light of the Lord God. He could not see the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was above him. And you know what? I've been there. Now, I, I can identify with him perfectly. And the only thing you can do is beg for his mercy. Beg for the Lord God to, to, uh, to rescue from that situation. And, and David had a keen understanding. He knew exactly where he was at. As a heavy burden... They are too heavy for me. Another thing that robs the child of God and the payment for our own sin in this present time we live until we go home to be with the Lord is the things that we pick up. And you know, if they're under the blood of Christ, why do we pick them up? Number one, it's, it, it's our nature. That's why all these works-based salvations out there are what they are, is they want to do something. That's the nature of man. See, the garments that Adam and Eve made were very different than the garments that God made, were they not? But they made an effort, right? They tried. You know why? They wanted to cover their sins. And here we find, why do we pick up things that are under the blood of Christ? But we do it all the time. We, we do it constantly. And, and that's, uh, you know what? It's all consuming when we do that. You can't do anything good enough for that, so put it down. You, you can't strive up forgiveness, so just place it down. It's under the blood of Christ. And you know, when we do that, we'll have a sweeter walk with it. Mm -hmm. But it's the inclination to pick it straight back up. Mike, well... I did it again. And, and, and so we see that David understood this in, in a very uh, particular way. And it was weighing him down spiritually and weighing him down carnally till he did not know what to do. We, uh, 
we need to understand to put this aside. Uh, verse 5, my wounds stink. Now, I've heard lots of presumptions, uh, lots of ideas, presuppositions of what this might have been uh, from venereal disease all on. But we know that a type of sin in the Bible is leprosy. We have no documentation that he ever had leprosy, but we do know it's a type of sin. And we know that he was being concerned. He said that he, his, his skin was in a, in a horrible shape. When you, when you look at somebody, what's one of the first things you see? Their skin. Mine's darker than most people in this room, probably the darkest. Uh, uh, Sarah is a very fair complected young lady probably the lightest in the room. You, you see that about them as soon as someone walks in the room. A uh, person of a different race, immediately you recognize it. See, your sin's a lot more obvious than you think, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As soon as David walked in the room, they had to see those loathsome wounds. He wasn't the only one aware of them. Big scabs and sores. And, and, and just, just obvious to everybody, you know, your sin that you allow in your life is a lot more recognizable to others than you think it is. That's right. we, we don't have it yet. We haven't arrived at that. The only thing to hide your sin is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Plus nothing, minus nothing. So David recognized that and he says, uh, you, you, you can see it in even who I am, in the way I look, the way I present. It's on my skin. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Now, I want you to point this out because it's often missed. He didn't say it was because of his nature. He says because of my foolishness. You, you, you know what will get you into trouble? Now, spiritually, we're preserved in in the blood of Christ. It is said of David, he was a man after, after God's own heart. What could be better? But yet he had this bend toward sin. And he says, because of my foolishness. You know what? You think about how foolish it is to get involved in sin when you're, when you're one of the very God of God's elect and covered by the blood of Christ and we get so involved in sin. I told the story many times when I got through a through out of Wooten's pool hall. You know what? That was pretty foolish. When you're outnumbered by Houston County and it's probably two to one and making fun of how they talk, you know what? It was stupid. And Mr. Wooten, the owner of the pool hall, was a Houston County in two. What did we think was gonna happen? You see what I'm saying? It was foolish. But yet and still we did it. And you know what? To that, it was, uh, it was repercussions. Mr. Wooten thought to throw us out and told us not to come back for two weeks. It was, it was repercussions for it. You see what I'm saying? And it's the very same way with us today. That there's results of sin. We need to recognize them. It's not wise to ignore them. It is far more important to recognize them and learn from them. He said, I did this because I was foolish. I, I wasn't thinking like a believer. I wasn't thinking like a Christian. I wasn't thinking about my God and what this would, how this would impact my walk with them. I was foolish. Verse 6. I'm troubled. <coughs> Listen, when you're troubled, you can't sleep, can you? You ever had a child you weren't sure where they were? That's troubling, isn't it? Don't know if they're okay. Don't know if they got enough to eat. Don't know if they have a warm place to sleep. Isn't it amazing the love, the love you have for your children? Even at 32, you want to be sure they have what they need. And I'm sure when Adam's 52, I'll still be in the same shape. And so we find that David's very much like that. He's troubled. But instead of being troubled over his children, he was troubled over the sin in his life. You know the only way to deal with something that's troubling you is to deal with it. To acknowledge it and deal with it. 
If you find out you have a disease, the only way to treat it is number one, acknowledge it and say, oh yeah, I do have congestive heart failure. And here's this little bitty tiny pill called Lasix, and it's going to help me. And I'm going to take it because it's effective. But before you get to that, what good would us to do? Oh no, I don't have congestive heart failure. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I sure know it's not that. Isn't that the, isn't that the nature of the flesh? Yeah, there may be something wrong with me, but I know it ain't because I got sin in my life. So David was flip-flopping and troubled and losing his sleep, and he knew very good and well what it was. He understood it was his situation uh, with Bathsheba, but it, but he, but he had. It has to be acknowledged. We want a sweet relationship with God and we want smoothness in, in this life. We have to understand that sin must be dealt with. <coughs> I'm troubled. I'm bowed down. Now, when it comes to the bowing down of David, I think personally, he is having depression. Do you know depression is a real illness? We used to think and it, this was even in the early part of my nursing career, and it be, they began to understand it more and more. Used to, depression was considered just a mental illness. Oh, buck up and go on. Kick yourself in the seat of the pants and move on. That, that was a theory to deal with depression, right? But then later, by the mercy of God... And, and by the understanding that God granted men, we, we learned there's this little chemical called serotonin. And we found that people with severe depression didn't have as much as other people did. And we began to treat it like an illness. Now, therapy does help. And good talk with God, if it's a sin problem, just go to the Creator. Go to him and say, this is my situation. So all this chaos in David's life resulted in a great deal of depression for him. You know what? When we're living outside the will of God and we are genuinely born again, depression can only be the only result. And if an individual can live that way and be happy as a lark, something's wrong spiritually. And so we find... That, that David, it was kind of imploding on himself, his physical health, his mental health. He was paying the price for his relationship with Bathsheba that he had already been warned against before it ever occurred. And he did it anyway. He's just a common man like you and I. And he responded, so, but there were, there were repercussions. I go mourning. All the day long. Now to mourn, what is a, a requirement? What is something that has to have occurred for mourning to take place? Something or someone has to have died, right? The result to a death for people that loved is mourning. Now what died with David? We know well, first of all, we know the son died, right? But I don't think that that was the only thing. I believe his relationship with God was so impacted, he began to mourn and grieve. You know, I never had a child to die and pray to God that I'm buried long before my children are. But, if I did, I would to God that I would find, I would find my solace in Him. Could you imagine being in a situation where you were bearing a child and you were so far from God he wouldn't hear you? You know, that's a very realistic thing that could happen. If it could happen to David, it most certainly could happen to you. And, and, and so we find that, um, again, God knows how to whip us. And he knew exactly how to get to David. You know what? He loved his children so much. Think about when Absalom was in full rebellion. He learned of Absalom's death. Absalom, Absalom, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son. You see, God knows where to get us at that. 
Would to God we never get in such a shape that he had to take one of our own to get our attention. But he does. He does. And, and, and so we find that uh, David understood his situation and he knew he needed spiritual help. For my loins, verse 7, are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and so broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee and my groaning is not hid from thee. Now that's a very precious verse in the first part of nine, if we could say this with re reality, for my, all my desire is before thee. What do you desire more than anything else? Have you ever thought about that? What's chief on your list? Would to God, if we were all in the will of God, my chief desire is to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, my, 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 my goal, the way that I would love to be, is to be like David, be like Moses. When, Mo, when God told Moses, no man can see me and live, you know what? He's ready to look at him anyway. <laughs> That's a rich blessing, isn't it? See, to give up this life, to have a, have a unique relationship with God. That, that, that's where David wanted to be again. He had enjoyed that. And he had destroyed it by his own actions. And so we see that he paid the price in his flesh, but more hurtful than that, he had paid for it in his relationship with the Lord God. And this, this, is, this is mankind. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to take a few thoughts from that and, and we'll be done. Hebrews chapter 12 and beginning in verse 5. Very familiar verses again. Hebrews 12 and verse 5. I personally believe Paul right into the church at Jerusalem. And ye have forgotten the exhortation the encouragement, the, 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 the sermon that's a validation sermon which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. In other words, don't give up, don't faint, don't, don't pass off the scene, don't thirst to death. And by the way, that is taken from Job chapter 5 and verse 17. It's, a, it's a, almost a complete quote. Uh, verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So we, we find uh, two different types of things, the chastening of our God, and, and then more severe still, the scourging. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ went through a scourging on our behalf. Do you remember the type of punishment that is? It's 39 stripes save one. Uh, excuse me, 40 stripes save one. 39 stripes with a, with a horrible piece of equipment. And we find here that our Lord does that. He, he, he does it for a reason. He does it for correction. And even beyond correction, he does it to say, this one is mine. This one belongs to me. He is mine. And because he did this, I'm going to rebuke him. Uh, I found that to be holy truth in my whole life. Uh, and, and I'll give you a good example. I had about five and very usually, loosely using the term friend, but of my friends as a child, I only have, I, I, none of them will talk to me, and two of them are dead. You see what I'm saying? And you t sometimes look at that, and is that chasing? No, I don't think so. I've had a lot of health problems that they never experienced. You remember when David said uh, he sought <coughs> the Lord three separate times to get his eyes back? It never did happen. He he chases he chasteneth those he loveth. 
And that's, that, that's why it shouldn't be upsetting. It should be a time of rejoicing. It, it should, yes, I, I messed up. Lord, please forgive me. But at the very same time, glory to God, I'm His. I belong to Him. He whipped me good. That means He's my Father. And that's exactly how, <laughs> that's exactly how we should look at it. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh you as children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For the Lord loveth to chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now, think about that. What son do you not whip? I didn't have any of mine that I did to whip. But, say, a man like Reuben. Remember Reuben, the oldest brother? He went into the harlot and had a child by her. And uh, so you had an illegitimate son somewhere. You gonna take him a present on his birthday? You gonna send him a little money under the sun? Probably not. And you know why? That acknowledges him. That says, truly, he is mine. <laughs> he gets out of line. You, you, you hear this illegitimate child is being mean to his mother. You can go down there and whip him? No. They don't even know he's yours. So we find that what, what the Lord is doing in our chastening is saying, yes, this one truly does belong to me. Verse 7, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son, what, for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if we be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, every one of us, then are you bastards and not sons. The illegitimate child doesn't get proper rebuke. He's not raised well. He's not really a son at all. So don't, don't be troubled at the chastening of the Almighty. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we have, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? We need, to, we need to acknowledge. When the Lord rebukes us, say, hey, I know exactly why this happened. I know, I know specifically what I did, and God is just, very just and right in doing this. That, 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 that in essence, is uh, what we used to see in churches when people acknowledged sin and they confessed it before the body. You know, when, uh, when Peter, uh, uh, excuse me, James was writing, and I believe general epistle, it went to the church of, at Jerusalem too. Confess your faults one to another and pray ye one for another. See, acknowledging that you have erred is, is everything. We, we want to keep it so private, don't we? Well, you go ahead and you bear that you bear that burden alone because that's what you'll end up doing. That's why we pick it back up again, right? Okay.